please join me in giving a warm Georgia Tech welcome to Gary Pages. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. I'm really happy to be back. Uh, Fifteen years ago, just, just about, I graduated from Georgia Tech uh, in the public policy school. A uh, little bit of my background, when I started at Georgia Tech, I was actually a mechanical engineering major. Any engineering majors here? Didn't stick, I'll be honest. Uh, didn't go all that well. Had a short stint in chemistry after that. That went worse than mechanical engineering. Uh, but it turns out that around 2001, the uh, Georgia Tech, uh, Ivan Allen College, was starting a public policy major. I think it had only been around for about a year before then. And the classes that I was taking and were enjoying, it turned out, were all at the School of Public Policy. They were also the classes I was taking and actually passing successfully, allowing me to keep a GPA to stay in this school. So I decided to make a change, and it turned out to be a, a pretty good change. Um, really giving a liberal arts background tied to a, uh, a core in technology and science that has really been advantageous um, pretty much in any endeavor that I've taken, both professionally and personally. So uh, certainly an advocate for Georgia Tech in the way that it blends uh, the tr big trends that are happening across the world right now with a really fantastic education. So just the fact that you're, you're here in what, when I was a student here, was a remote parking lot is really cool. So I want to start telling you a little bit about Redwoods. As mentioned, Redwoods is an insurance company, which is pretty much the most boring way that you can describe it, in my view. Uh, does anyone here grow up wanting to be in the insurance industry? No one's ever raised their hand on that. Nobody does. I certainly didn't. Uh, but what I've learned with the platform of business and the platform of insurance is that whether, just like a nonprofit or an NGO or working with the government, it's an area that you can have tremendous impact. At Redwoods, we don't exist to make a profit. Now, we are a for-profit company, and as I'll talk about, we're actually a certified B Corporation. But why we exist is to create safe communities for all. We insure YMCAs, Jewish community centers, boys and girls clubs, and nonprofit residential camps, usually nature-based camps. And the reason we serve these, uh, these organizations is because they're the organizations that are in their community serving their people and actively making the communities stronger and healthier places to be. Now those organizations, whether it be a Y or a Boys and Girls Club, can't do that if they can't keep the people in their care safe. And whenever you're working with children in particular, there are severe risks that you face. Risk of drowning, risk of automobile accidents, one of the biggest risks we face is the risk of child sexual abuse. And the more and more we work with camps, elevation risks on things like climbing walls, zip lines, and towers. To make their community safer, they go out and as nonprofit organizations, work with kids who are sometimes some of the most disadvantaged kids in the community. And they need to know how to keep them safe. Now, if you're a YMCA, there are resources out there. There's YMCA of the USA. There's different industry kind of periodicals. You can read about safety. But what we have at Redwoods is we ensure about half of all of the YMCAs across the country. We know how people get hurt. We know when they get hurt. We know where they get hurt. We know, unfortunately, exactly how those sorts of things happen. And we're able to share what we learn to help change behaviors and keep people safe. That's the core of what Redwoods does, to create safe communities for all. How we do it is a little bit interesting. As I mentioned, we don't exist to make a profit, even though we have to make a profit to be sustainable in what we do. About seven years ago, we, had a, we still have a company slogan called Serve Others, but we challenged our staff to write a corporate purpose statement for us. And we had a group, it took about six months of revision and going back and bringing it back to the entire company. But we, what they came up with, I thought was a pretty pro profound purpose statement. At Redwoods, we are change makers. Society's status quo is unacceptable to us. And we're called to play a role in improving our communities. As a social enterprise, we believe that business can and should be a powerful force for positive social change. 
I'll get into how we do that a little bit as well, but I did, there's one thing I did forget to mention. Uh, I'm quite happy with questions, interruptions, conversations, tangents, um, so you do not have to hold your questions to the end. If there's something you go, hey, what does that mean? Can you explain that a little bit more? I'm happy to get into that, so. I love you just jumping right into that, like yeah. you're waiting for it. We do, actually, and, and it's fairly unique in the insurance industry. We actually will send one of our consultants out to any customer that we're gonna work with before we work with them. So before we even quote them and then offer them and they pay us, we go out and give them a safety assessment. And they get that for free. And there's a couple things that it does. It lets us know, is this a risk that we wanna work with? You know, there are some organizations that they need a lot of work. And we wanna be there to work with them, but from a financial standpoint, we, they can't afford for us to bear that risk because it would be too expensive. So we'll go out and give you, here's your safety plan that you need to work on, and here's how we can work on, uh, on it with you. And when you get to this point, come back, we may be able to insure you. Uh, but yes, we send them out, all of our customers get at least one visit a year from a, a dedicated consultant. Good question. Yeah, so you know, what's interesting is uh, there's a little bit more to this, and it still doesn't me mention insurance. Um, insurance is the engine by which we do what we, we do, but it's not our purpose. If we could not provide insurance, we'd find another way to do this. <coughs> now, we happen to have a lot of people who are really good at insurance, and we're owned by a larger insurance company, so we're probably gonna stick with insurance for now. But what's important to us is that dedication to being a positive force for, for social change. Yes. Yes. All right. So it does a couple things, right? It gives them an introduction to us and it knows that we're gonna be able to work with them because one thing that's different about us as well, we ask a lot of our customers. Right, we need you to improve your behaviors to keep kids safe, which means when we give you, you know, something that's important to do, we expect it to get done. And if you can't get that done, we're not going to continue working with you in, into the future. So it's, we have to know that we have a strong enough relationship that we can work both ways on that. Yes, we have. So what we've had in a couple cases is we'll go out, we'll give that assessment. Now what they don't get is our help then implementing the assessment, but they'll get, all right, here's a safety plan for you, and ultimately they go with a different insurance company. That does happen. Now, in most, for most insurance companies, and I don't want to get too deep into the insurance industry because that's not what you signed up for, but most insurance companies actually only write and work with about 10 to 15 percent of the business that they quote. We win on about 60 percent of the business that we quote. And our renewal retention, so customers who come back to us year over year, is traditionally over 90 percent every year, which is really kind of unheard of in the insurance industry. So we know, we think it's smart to have that upfront investment to what's likely to going to be a long-term relationship with what we have. We have had a couple customers though that we've met, we've said this is what we do, and they said that's not what we want, and that's okay. If that's not what you want, then we're not gonna be the right partners for that. So what does that mean in terms of what we do for our company being a powerful force for positive social change? I'll tell you a little bit about my background to, to explain that. So I mentioned what I majored in at, at Georgia Tech at various times. What I spent most of my time doing was working at the swimming pool at, what's it called, the Campus Recreation Center. It was the Student Aquatic Center, Athletic Center back then. I worked the 5 a.m. shift, which is fun. So you get up at about 4.30 in the morning, walk over there, get onto the pool deck for swim practice at 5 in the morning. I usually work about 5 to 11 or 5 to noon. Um, and then I would go out and go to classes. You'd spend most of that time you know, lifeguarding. When you weren't on the stand, you'd be doing your homework and doing your reading. So it worked out pretty well. 
actually worked out well when I was in law school as well, because I'd get up at four in the morning, do all of my reading at 5 a.m., and then get into law school from there. I've always been more of a morning person than a night person. Uh, but during the summers, I also went back to my, my hometown pool, where I grew up as one of those kids, kind of a pool rat at the pool. Right, so I spent every day growing up going to swim lessons, going to swim team. As soon as I was old enough to be a lifeguard, I got a job as a lifeguard. Continued lifeguarding through school, taught swim lessons, uh, was the swim team coach, was the dive team coach. There. Uh, so that's how I made my money. When I graduated from the School of Public Policy, I had an awful lot of internship opportunities, none of which were, had any desire to pay me money. That was a bit of a problem. So I actually went back home to my hometown in New Jersey and went back to the swim club that I had been uh, working at in the summers and just started you know, chatting up people that I had known. And I started talking to one gentleman who I had taught his kids swim lessons. I was their swim team coach. And he asked me what I'd been up to. I told him what I did at Tech. I told him that I was also a lifeguard. Um, Georgia Tech Aquatics for years has been one of the best uh, aquatic safety facilities in the entire country. I don't know if you're aware of that, one of the leading uh, it's called Ellison Associates Facilities, which is kind of top of the line aquatic safety, and learned a lot about it here. And he said, well, that's interesting. Send me your resume. All right. What I didn't know at the time was he was general counsel for Redwoods. So he said, all right, well, what we've got here is uh, we work with YMCAs, and YMCAs have a drowning problem. Back in the 90s and early 2000s, between 12 to 15 people were dying from drowning every year in YMCA pools with lifeguards on them. So we had kids, usually 16, 17 years old, paid to lifeguard, and yet people were still dying at a pretty alarming rate across YMCAs. So I was hired to go look, figure that out, look into it. And for about the first two to three years of working with Redwoods, I was on the road nonstop driving from YMCA to YMCA, usually a couple wet bathing suits hanging out in the back of a rental car. And I would go in, usually sneak into the Y, that was the more fun way to do it. And then I would videotape the lifeguards. Now videotaping people now is easy, by the way. You, it's unfair, you just take this out and pretend you're playing with it and you can videotape. I had a full camera that I had to hide in a gym bag <laughs> with like tapes and DVD and little CDs that you had to change. It was much harder to film people back then. And we'd film, what were the lifeguards doing? We're in a secret shop. I would then actually jump in the pool and pretend to drown. This was fun. Uh, I could hold my breath for a decent amount of time. I'm naturally not buoyant at all, so I sink right down to the bottom. Uh, and quite often I'd be waiting down at the bottom, this is taking an awful long time <laughs> for people to get there. We would take mannequins and sneak them into the pool. We had to figure out what was going on. And we learned a couple things about lifeguarding in that. We learned that humans are terrible at finding things on the bottom of the pool. One is they weren't trained appropriately. Most lifeguards were not sitting in the elevated chair. They were distracted by other tasks. They'd be sitting in low-level chairs. I've seen th reading books, playing cards with each other, balancing checkbooks. And this was before people had cell phones. You know, so now it can be even worse. So we said, okay, you can't be distracted by anything if you're a lifeguard. You need to be in the elevated chair or at the edge of the pool. Just that and enforcing that rule brought drownings down significantly at YMCA's, probably to about eight per year. Next was we had to teach them how to actually find someone at the bottom of the pool. One other part of my job during this time is I, I would go on our uh, drowning investigations. Again, where we're a little bit unique on our claim side is we don't wait to, until a lawsuit comes in. As soon as a person is pulled out of a swimming pool at one of our customers, they call us up. And we're out there usually within about 24 hours to do a full investigation of the, the fatal or non-fatal event that took place. It's a fairly high cost, but compared to the cost of a drowning victim, both morally and financially, it's absolutely worth it. So we've investigated over 250 drowning events over the last 10 years and we learned what the trends were. We learned what lifeguards would say. Every single time they would say, it happened so fast. I just turned my head for a second, looked back, and someone was yelling, someone was on the bottom of the pool. What we learned from those investigations is when they turned their head for a second, you know how long it took? 
three minutes because humans get distracted easily. We also learn from putting things on the bottom of the pool and pretending to drown that even when you're looking at something, if you don't expect to find it, your brain doesn't let you see it. And lifeguards would miss obvious bodies or mannequins directly in front of them. Never see it. And what's fun, interesting is that's actually something I learned here at Georgia Tech. We were doing those at the Student Aquatic Center before we were doing it at Redwoods. And I remember one of the first lifeguards I did that to here. We had a, a, a child-sized mannequin about this big. It wore bright red swim shorts. And someone would go up, talk to the lifeguard quickly to distract them while someone else slipped the mannequin underwater. And the first guard we did it to, we put it 10 feet in front of her, right in front, bright red, could easily see. After she was done talking, she went back to moving her head and scanning. And I had started my watch. And two minutes went by. Six minutes went by. Seven minutes went by. You're at the point where this child would be dead. She wasn't thinking she wasn't doing a good job. She just had no idea how to actually do the job. The lifeguard manuals had not trained her how to do that. And when we went up and pointed out that it was right there, you saw her completely shocked that she had missed it for that amount of time. So we started implementing that across our YMCAs and teaching them how to do it. We only worked with YMCAs at that time. We started putting out videos and trainings. We started working with YMCA of the USA and really key influencers across the aquatics movement to say, I know you think you can do this, but here's the data that we're seeing and here's what's going wrong. And we're able to move that number. Our model, and this came out a little bit squish, but our model is we take the data that we find and the, integrate the experience and best practices from across movements to change the operating behavior of our customers and help them to change their behavior. Now that's actually pretty difficult. People changing their own behavior and their own habits is really, really difficult. And there's a whole science behind what goes into that as well. It's not just make people understand it, they have to feel that there's a reason they need to change. But that allows us to reduce injuries and save lives, and the more that we can do that, the more we can grow our programs. And because we have a track record of safety that comes with working with us. That's been our model since I've worked with Redwoods. What it's led to was in the 90s and early 2000s, I mentioned about 13 drowning deaths per year. The average right now is under one drowning death per year across all of the YMCAs. It's actually about 0.75. And how people drown is different. When we got it down to about two to two per year, we implemented a new program which has now been adopted movement-wide called Test, Mark, and Protect. Which means you swim test kids, you mark them with either a wristband or a neckband, and then they're protected with a life jacket or someone in the water with an arm's reach of them. Kids, by and large, do not die from drowning in YMCA and lifeguarded facilities we work with anymore. What we do still have happening that we're working on is adults have medical events, and when you have someone who is swimming really slowly in the middle of the pool and they just stop and go to the bottom, that's really hard for a lifeguard to see. And we have people doing what's called shallow water blackout and hypoxic training, where usually young, fit guys who are good swimmers, I say guys intentionally, it's almost all men, go in to, and see either how many laps they can swim underwater or they go to the bottom and hold their breath for as long as they can without moving. And then they die. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's still happening uh, one every other year or so in YMCAs. But if you look up shallow water blackout or hypoxic training, you can see that the people are still dying from this. We're going to fix that too. We're already working with technology companies that have drowning detection software. One out of Raleigh that we're working with uh, is really cool. It's a neckband that kids wear. They don't even realize they're wearing it after a while. And what, what was cool at first is it's a, uh, it's a submersion alarm. So if they go underwater for more than a certain period of time, it sounds an alarm that they're underwater. That's cool in and of itself. What's really cool is the data that it produces. So it can track hundreds of swimmers, and it's all taking their data in, and it's showing how long they're underwater and their motion of their neck around the surface. What's cool is now that they're starting to use that and look at that data and start to apply some algorithms to it, they're going to be able to track when a person starts the drowning process by a particular signature. So you're going to know beforehand, not just an alarm someone's underwater, but there's an alarm that someone's in distress. So some pretty cool stuff that's coming from that. One of the other areas I mentioned that we work a lot on is child sexual abuse prevention. This is a much harder problem 
than drowning. Drowning's physical. Drowning, you know where it happens, when it happens. All you have to do is keep someone from being underwater. Child sexual abuse is a much more difficult problem. And it's one that, from a financial standpoint, is more costly and more uncertain than drowning or other injuries. Uh, and if anyone pays any attention to the news right now, knows what's going on with USA Gymnastics, the Me Too movement, all things that have had to happen, and I'm glad that they are happening, they are forward steps that need to be taken. But what it means is that the public, thankfully, has no tolerance for child sexual abuse anymore. In, what that means across the insurance industry is insurance companies are getting away from it as fast as possible. They're starting to exclude coverage for it, not work with organizations that have a risk of child sexual abuse because they don't want to be uh, on the hook for a future jury verdict in the tens of millions or higher. We, we don't run away from that if it's our core business. So we need to know how to stop it. Back in the early 2000s, we would have more than one report of child sexual abuse every day at Redwoods. Most of them were children abusing other children. Most of them were um, somewhere, it's hard to say there's a spectrum of abuse, but inappropriate behavior as opposed to really horrific types of things. But by again, learning the data, learning when they happened, where they happened, how they happened, and then working to change behaviors, we've got that down to about 150 abuse incidents every year across uh, the same number of customer base. This also mirrors national statistics. Nationally, not just with what we've been doing, but with kind of the national uh, enlightenment around this issue, the reports have gone down. Now what happened first was a spike. Right? Things started to come up that had never been talked about before, but now if you go to a boys and girls club, it looks completely different than a boys and girls club six or seven years ago. Right? You're not just sending kids to the bathroom alone, they're supervised. Counselors are not allowed to babysit kids and be with them outside of the program, transport them in their cars. They know that things like gift giving and favoritism are red flags. And so all of this education, again, from what is learned in the aggregate, is what's helping us to change these behaviors. And when we change these behaviors and have lower losses, that is good, for, obviously, financially for the, the company that is bearing the risk. Any questions? Yes, I mean, so this is kind of the external model of what, what Redwoods does. I want to talk a little bit about what we do internally. I mentioned that we're a B corporation, which means we exist not just to make profit, but uh, operate toward a triple bottom line. Profit, people, and planet. We, are, we strive to be environmentally sustainable. Now, working as an insurance company, we don't have a supply chain or anything like that, so it's a little bit difficult, but we do try to source kind of our office products sustainably, have carbon offsets, things like that. We focus really highly on our communities and our people. So here are a few of the, th the policies and internal things that we have at Redwoods. We have a service requirement for all of our employees. So all of our staff are required to give 40 hours of community service every year. And that's paid time. All right, so the company pays for them to do that. Why, why is that important? That's, that's absolutely right. right. One is getting you just involved in your community and to help the community that you're in. Right? So if, if we're helping to lift everyone up, that helps our community. But the compassion, and there's a word that's important that we use, is empathy. When we're especially thinking about handling claims, we need to know who we're talking to on the other side of the phone, and we have to be able to feel what they feel. And that's what empathy is. So if you're working at Habitat, for example, and you're working alongside a homeowner, a future homeowner who has is struggling to make ends meet and hasn't had a safe place and healthy place to live, the next time you're on a phone with someone who's brought, whose child was hurt at a boys and girls club or a subsidized YMCA program, you can feel what that person can feel. And it's a completely different place that you work from. It's a strategic advantage for us as well as just being good for the community. We match all of our employees' charitable donations. In some cases, $2 on the dollar depending on what it is. We want to encourage people to invest financially in the community as well as just their service. And we do have, last I checked, it was 90 something percent of our customers taking advantage, our customers, our employees taking advantage of that match. 
We have a family-friendly work environment and benefits, and I'll explain what this means. Uh, we've done a few things over the past two years toward this, because as we were learning, you know, we had done a few things easy early on, right? So we matched paternity leave to maternity leave. Turns out that's not really enough to start attacking inequality between male and female in the workforce. So now you can bring your kids to work whenever you want. We have kid-friendly work environment. This, it sounds weird, but this was taken from another insurance company that does pet insurance and you can bring pets to work. The way, wait, we insure people who work with kids. Shouldn't we be able to bring kids to work? And started as a joke and turned into real. We have a lot of parents who work for us, and quite often you can't get daycare. Right? Somebody, their school is canceled, your child is sick and can't go in, you can bring them to the office. You can also work at home if that's more convenient for you to be able to do it, but we actually think it, actually, it adds to our environment quite well to have kids come into the office. You still have to get your work done, right? and we don't run a daycare, but you can always bring your child into the office. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, Flex. You can work from anywhere. We also just instituted what we call responsible time off, where we have no vacation policy anymore. If you need to take your kid to the doctor, if you need to go to the doctor, if you need to take time off, you can take it. You're measured by the work that you get done, not the time that you spend in a chair. With a couple exceptions of uh, you know, our receptionist, who actually is paid for the time that he's in that chair. Right? So there's a very few exceptions to that, but a very family-friendly work environment and benefits. We pay in-state college tuition for any employee, for their children. They gotta maintain a good GPA. It's kinda like the, uh, the scholarships here. You gotta maintain a GPA to keep it. But the burden, of college, um, the burden of college is too much for some to be able to send to it. And the amount of debt that people are getting into, you might know something about that. We know is a big policy issue, so we'll pay in-state tuition for any employees. All these would seem to have a lot of costs. Mm-hmm. It, it, so if you go up high enough, it is publicly held. So, we're, so we started as a private company, um, really mom and pop uh, insurance company, oddly enough. Uh, but in 2015, we were acquired by Crum and Forster, which is one of the largest insurance companies in the United States, which is owned by Fairfax Financial, which is based out of Toronto, which is one of the largest insurance holding companies uh, in the world. We are part of Stump Carmen Forrester, and we fought with them quite a bit early on about policies and what we were going to keep and what we weren't going to take of theirs, for example. A little. <laughs> we haven't been able to move them as, as much as we'd like to, uh, but we are responsible as an entity of theirs. We have to make a profit, and we have to report that up to them. How we do it in our own accounting, that's up to us in what we do. Now we had some folks, and one of the reasons we were purchased by Crum and Forster and by Fairfax was because of really the advantage of our philosophy and how we work as a customer first and specialist insurance company. It's something that Crum and Forster was, is striving to become because what they see is that the future of insurance, um, and as we'll get into the future of work a little bit, they're not gonna be able to compete with the big generalists. So how do you specialize and be able to find the right niche markets to be able to do that. So that's what we're helping to teach Crum and Forrester. Now, what all of these things get to, though, is, all, there, yes, there absolutely is a cost to them. I've never thought that the cost, I, I've, I, actually, at any of these, I've never even questioned the cost when it comes up. So we do a few things differently. Most insurance companies pay big bonus structures. We don't pay a bonus structure like that. If, you know, if we get to a point that we make enough profit to pay bonuses, we pay from the lowest employee first and do it a, a pro rat away from there. So while Crum and Forrester will have on their books in other areas very big bonus structures where they're paying out hundreds of thousands of dollars to the top, we just don't have that on our books. It allows us to do other things like this. Uh, also, our, our average wages tend to be lower uh, than the insurance industry as a whole. We have a couple advantages there as well. We're based out of Raleigh-Durham, not New York or Chicago. And so the cost of living is a little bit less and we can attract people to come down uh, for a lower cost of living, pay a little bit less in a wage overall, and then add benefits like this. 
as well. So I think it actually comes out pretty even. A couple new things we're working on. One is uh, racial equity training. So it wasn't good enough, we, we decided, um, after kind of learning the hard way a little bit, just to, be, to say diversity is important to you. How are we, if we're looking to change the status quo, the question that was brought up is, well, how are you actually fighting systemic racism in your community and in the insurance industry, which is extraordinarily old, white, and male? And what I can tell you is we're not there yet. We have things in our hiring practices that we need to work at, look at. We're actually working on surveying our own uh, employees to say, is the experience of our, uh, of our African-American staff different than our, our white staff? It might be, and we honestly, we got to the question and said, yeah, we actually don't know the answer to that question. That's not good. So we need to figure that out. But one of the things that we did last year is we had a great exhibit at the North Carolina Museum of Science called Race. And it was talking about the social construct of race from a scientific perspective. We brought everybody to that. And then had a facilitated discussion uh, with the leader of that exhibit to say, what does this mean for you? Again, why is this important? Well, we have to work with each other every single day. If you don't understand where people are coming from, the struggles that they're facing, how they perceive the world, you're not going to have a great workplace. But also, we're working with YMCAs, Jewish community centers, boys and girls clubs, how do we serve those customers if we don't understand the issues that they face every day and the diversity of those issues? We're still a work in progress in that, and I don't know exactly what the, the final answer is to that, but it's something that we're very conscious of. The other, and this is an area we've actually conflicted with Crum and Forrester quite a bit, is we have an active corporate voice. We speak on social issues. I actually wrote an article that we sent out to all of our customers after the Las Vegas shooting. We wrote about what we saw in Charlottesville. And we put that out not just to our customers, but we put it out widely that this is what we believe. When North Carolina passed HB2, we took a stand as a company. If anyone doesn't know what HB2 is, the anti-gay marriage law in North Carolina. It made the news quite a bit, and I think it was pretty bad for North Carolina for many, many reasons. We, we put out a statement that as a company, we oppose this. Now, what's interesting is, I don't know that all of our employees agree with that. I don't know that, well, I know we have gun-owning gun employees. What we do when we do that is we spark a conversation and we try to make it as safe as possible to have that conversation. So when we wrote about the Las Vegas shooting, we then started a, uh, a session on gun safety, and we put out a, a, an article every month on the issue of gun safety from many different views, but from the position that if we exist to make communities that are safe from all, what does that mean for people who are opposed to guns, people who are responsible gun owners, people who strongly support the Second Amendment? There's always a lot of issues there, and we want to be able to spark that conversation. Now, when we started with Crum and Forrester, they're not a company that takes corporate stances on things. Uh, and I had many a conversation with their legal department about things that we would put out, most of which would end with their general counsel saying, we will note your noncompliance. <laughs> but we've gotten to the point that they have stopped making that, those calls. They just know that that's what we're going to do. Uh, and to me, it comes from a place of authenticity. If we're going to talk about community safety, then we have to be able to do that. So these are some things that we do, but honestly, I don't think we're unique in this. I mentioned that we're a certified B Corporation, and there's a community of like-minded, uh, for-profit corporations that do all of these things, and honestly, better than we do in a lot of cases. Anyone here familiar with B Corporations before I mentioned it today? Okay, a handful of folks. So what a B Corporation is, it is, it is a for-profit corporation that to be a certified B Corporation, you are actually uh, measured by a third party, usually B Lab, which is the company that kind of runs B Corporations, but there are other third parties that do it, that holds you to a metric that says, I, am, I get this much of a score for environmental consciousness, this much for serving my community, this much for being good for employees. 
There is also what's called a, a B Corporation legal status, which was started by B Labs. It's in about 32, don't quote me on that, states right now. North Carolina, unfortunately, is not one of them. But Delaware is, which is pretty important from a corporate form standpoint, that allows you to register as a, as a B Corporation, as opposed to an S Corp or a C Corp. These are all companies that exist for a purpose higher than profit. Burt's Bees is an interesting example. They're not a B Corp. They used to be until they were purchased by Clorox. They're based out of Durham uh, as well. But they exist to create an environmentally sustainable organization. Their entire supply chain has to go through rigorous standards to make sure that they have a positive impact on the environment. Patagonia is one of my favorites. They existed to be an environmental company, and they do that by selling clothes. New Belgium, also a fan. New Belgium just wanted to make really good beer. And when they started doing it, said, and we need to do it in a way that is positive on the environment. They evolved into a B corporation. Now they have a plant in Asheville, North Carolina, that's completely wind powered. Their owners sold the entire company to their employees. That was their exit strategy. And so it's ways of doing business that is different than kind of the for-profit S-corp public corporation. What's interesting is there's been challenges to this. So a number of these companies, Redwoods being one of them, Etsy, Ben & Jerry's, Burt's Bees, were all bought by bigger companies. Ben & Jerry's and Burt's Bees have had an interesting time of it. Ben & Jerry's is still a B corporation owned by Unilever. Unilever makes ice cream. And they've largely been able to keep exactly what they do. Burt's Bees is no longer a B Corporation. They weren't able to keep that status as a part of Clorox. And there was quite a lot of friction in the beginning. But what Clorox really liked about Burt's Bees was their brand. And in the natural care brand, they wanted to be a leader in that. And they saw Burt's Bees was that leader. And you can't change Burt's Bees from what they are and still be profitable in doing that. So there was a little bit of conflict at the end. One of my, my good friends works for Burt's Bees. And he said, what's happened over the last 10 years is Burt's Bees has become a much better company. They're more disciplined. They have more data that they're able to use. They have management. They're able to come together with teams from uh, Clorox and learn a whole lot more. But they've also made Clorox a better corporation, where now Clorox is led by Burt's Bees in looking at their supply chain. And this is a company that makes bleach, right? But looking at their environmental impact. And to the point where Clorox sometimes even pushes Burt's Bees now to be better in what they do. So it's a great impact that you can have. We're not quite there yet with Crum and Forrester, to be honest. We hope to get there sometime soon. But this is a growing movement. Next week, I'll be at the, the B Corp retreat in it's actually New Orleans this year. And there's over 500 B Corporations in the United States. It's represented in, I think, 80 countries right now across the globe of people who see the segment of for-profit business as a great way to lead positive social change. For a B Corporation and for Redwoods, profitability means sustainability. So if we're not profitable, what happens? We don't stay in business anymore. Crumman Forrester, who purchased us, likes what we do to a point. Right? We're not a charity. We have to return a profit to them. And I'll tell you what happened last year, we didn't. Last year we had a rough year, and I, I don't have time to talk about insurance accounting, thankfully. But we wound up losing, uh, you don't know until about 10 years after an insurance company what your actual end result is, but we probably lost about $6 million last year for a $50 million company. Not good. And it happened largely because of a couple large claims that hopefully will be smaller as they work out, but when you're only a $50 million company and you have $10 million in two big claims that you didn't see coming, that hurts. And reporting back up to Crum and Forster and up to Fairfax that we lost $6 million, that puts pressure on. It puts pressure on to say, to question all of the things that we do and all of the different ways that we do it. To question, you know, maybe you should start being more generalist. Maybe you should stop visiting every customer ahead of time because of the expense that that has. So it's difficult, but in the end, I actually think it's making us a better company. 
because we do have to question all of those things and find the sustainability and the sustainable way to do that. How do we scale our mission? How do we grow into new, into new movements in a way that is sustainable over time? And that's the way that B corporations have to think, whether you're owned by a larger one or independent. And it's important that we're sustainable because the future of work is changing. And in my view, B, B corporations through this look lens of sustainability have an advantage over most other companies. I'm going to kind of end this a little bit talking about where we see the future of work going. And I can talk, I definitely want your input on this because I'm going to talk a little bit about technology uh, here at a tech school. So obviously important to get feedback on that. But what we know is happening is the world is changing at an accelerated pace. My, I don't know if my daughter, who's six years old, will ever drive. Now, I don't think self-driving cars will be fully operational 10 years from now, but she certainly won't need to drive. And what I'm also noticing with kids, they don't have, I'm getting into kids these days talks. What I am noticing, though, with 12 and 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds, they have no desire to drive. They don't care about cars. You know, when I grew up, getting a car was the coolest possible thing that could happen. My 1989 Ford Escort was the best car on earth. I think it dissolved somewhere around here. But kids, yeah, they won't need to drive, right? What's allowing this to happen is the acceleration of computing power and network speed and availability. Next year, with kind of 5G networks coming online, we're going to see some pretty incredible things. So this is cool. But what does this do to? We know what it does to the taxi industry. What does it do to the trucking industry? What are you thinking if you're a trucker right now? What are you thinking if you're Redwoods and about a quarter of our business is auto insurance? What's auto insurance going to look like several years from now? We do, can we, you can have a package delivered by drone. Okay, that's just the coolest thing on earth. Right? We know this is gonna be happening more and more. It used to be that you needed someone who had to think to deliver packages. You had to know where, what the neighborhood was. You don't need that anymore. Anyone know what that is? That's a 3D printer. So 3D printers are also some of the coolest things. That is a 3D printer that will build you a house. Now, it's not the best house, I'll be honest. It, it looks kind of weird. I won't show the, the video of it. Um, but what does that mean if you're in the construction industry? And in Atlanta, there's a lot of people in the construction industry. You're coming through here. What does that mean if you offer builder's risk insurance policies? Which we have a company down the street from us called Builders Mutual. The whole company built on builder's risk policies. They, insure, they employ about 200 people. How do you feel if you're in that job? And if you're 25 in that job, you better be thinking, I'm not sure what the future of this is going to be. The fact is, the future of work is changing at a really fast pace. And it's incumbent for any company and any person to be able to keep up with it. Part of that is understanding the technological landscape. But more important than that is understanding that the future of work is more and more human than anything else. Which is interesting after putting up three pictures of robots to say that the future of work is human. We're seeing robotics in the insurance industry. So we're made up of mostly of underwriters, claims adjusters, and we have consultants as well, our, our kind of service delivery staff. An underwriter will look at an organization, they'll look at their loss history, they'll look at reams of data, and they'll use their intuition to figure out how to underwrite a property and the risk. It can take weeks. There are now computers that can do that in 30 seconds. So when you, anyone here have auto insurance? How long did it take you to get a quote? Click. How is it that they can quote your exact risk that quickly? They don't care about your exact risk. They're looking at millions of risks. If they get yours a little wrong, no big deal. It'll come out in the wash. There is a company right now that is using aerial photography, scrubbing publicly available data, and some drone footage to be able to quote commercial property in under two minutes. 
and they're going to get some wrong, but in the aggregate, their bet is that that cost structure will get it right. On the claim side of things, how long, if you get into an accident, how long does it take for you to get your check? Anyone been in an accident recently? Yeah, I, I got rear-ended a little while ago. How long traditionally does it take you to get a check in an auto accident? A few weeks? Yeah, they want to do it as quickly as possible because you're in a rental and they don't want to pay for that. Uh, so maybe a week. Companies now, you can get it in 30 minutes. You've been hit. We know what your car is. We know what the estimate of the damage is. You're paid. Because it's all being done with algorithms. Liability adjusters now at, at State Farm, Geico, the, the big companies, the adjusters do very little actual adjusting of a claim. They get the information, they put it in, and the program says, here's the number. And now they negotiate around that number with you. Completely different job than the old job was, all right, I get my clipboard and I go out. It's changing completely. So what does an underwriter or an adjuster do now? They have to be more human than before. Because the computer's taken the easy task away, what the computer is good at. Going way back machine into the, the 17th century, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. It used to be that thinking was what made us human. Well, what makes you human if machines can think, honestly, better than you can? Dov Seidman is a, a writer, and he worked with Thomas Friedman quite a bit, and two of my, my favorite writers on this subject. He says that what the future of work is that we have to do what is uniquely human. We have to do what robots can never do. We have to have a heart. That's what makes us different. The old model is I think, therefore I am. The new model is I care, therefore I am. I hope, therefore I am. I imagine. I am ethical, therefore I am. And I have a purpose. In our industry, this is our competitive advantage. We train our staff to be empathetic. Now, I do think empathy is somewhat ingrained, and some people will get it, some people won't, but it's also trainable. We train all of our adjusters to say, I'm sorry. We train them all to listen, and we train them all to ask, what do you need regardless of what the policy says? I'll give a, my favorite example of this is one of our adjusters, Kathy. She was telling me about a claim, and she was telling me about a good result. Right? If we thought it was going to settle for several hundred thousand dollars, it actually settled for about $90,000. And it was a young boy, he was about one year old, year old, playing on a caterpillar at daycare, and he fell off the caterpillar and broke his back. Pretty nasty claim, one where I'm actually not sure that we had that much liability in the case. It's certainly one that, you're gonna, that you can argue. Most claims adjusters go through a step process where they say, okay, let me look at the policy, what's the coverage? Now, is there liability? Let me get a legal opinion on this. And then would call the person up and say, either there's coverage or there isn't coverage. Here's what we think from a liability standpoint. We'll offer you this because this is what we think it's, it's about. Kathy, when she told me, she said, I can't imagine what that mom was going through. To have a one-year-old in a half-body cast for seven months. Ed has been around a kid, a, a one-year-old, not in a body cast for seven months. It's hard work. The fact that she approached it from that position completely changes how she adjusts the claim. Completely changes how she talks to mom, who was extremely angry about this. Completely changes what she offers in the beginning to say, what can we get you right now? Are you having trouble? You can't go to work right now. Let me help pay some of those bills. That was one that settled for roughly $500,000 less than the prediction was going to be because of the work that was done up front in being ethical, compassionate, and empathetic. That is the competitive advantage that we have. Machines can operate consistently. They can get to the numbers. But what you humans are needed for is to develop trust. And it's extremely crucial to be able to develop trust right now. The 2018, I, always worth looking at this, the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer tells you how much institutions are trusted. We're going steadily downhill. So government, no surprise, lost 14 points. About a third of the people trust government. Business, less than half, went down 10, though one of the highest trusts 
was people's own companies. People trust their own companies at about 80%. That tells you about the impact you can have within your own company. Media down, and even for the first time ever, nonprofits who we work with are under 50%. They call this a crisis of trust in the United States that takes immediate action. Because how does a society work together? How do you create a community that's safe for all people if there's not even a fundamental level of trust that people operate on? Now, I don't know that government's going to do anything real quick on this. Media is not helping, and government and media together aren't doing a fantastic job. NGOs and nonprofits can do better. Business, I think, is one of the untapped resources. When you think about companies that you trust, these are the types of companies that come to mind. So Burt's Bees is actually uh, ranked as, I think, the third most trusted brand in the United States. And they make skincare products. Redwoods, we did a net promoter score, which tells you a little bit about what your customers and non-customers are thinking of you. And we exceeded the industry average, which to be fair was low, but by about 70 points. Because we build that trust. Patagonia, I think, is a fantastic example of this. Anyone here a Patagonia fan? They tell you, don't buy our stuff. Right? Buy one shirt because it's built to last. They will take anything back and repair it. That's the type of competitive advantage. Things that so Patagonia does not compete with the whatever they sell at Old Navy kind of brands. Shirts that you can buy for $3 that are made in the Philippines or Bangladesh and are competing solely based on being the, the cheapest commodity. Those will still exist, but it won't be possible to compete with them because of their scale. Where you can compete as a different type of company is on that value. And I know you've had speakers tell you this before, but the future of work is changing. This presentation has an expiration date, and it's just about now. You have to be a lifetime learner. And when, I, when we talk about learning for a lifetime, it's not just learning new skills in terms of what your work skills are or your technology. It's learning more about how to be human. The work that we do at YMCAs in diversity, with boys and girls clubs who are brand, and camps who are bringing up the next generation of leaders, this is the work that's going to be the most important and work that everyone is going to have to be connected to as they continue to go through their education and through their work career. So thank you for your attention. I probably want more time than I was supposed to, but I was taking questions in the middle, so I think that that's, <laughs> that's fair. Certainly open to more questions, and I'm happy to hang around after if, since I didn't leave that much time. Thank you. Hi. Is this on? Sweet. So, right there. Oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> it's fine. Hi. Um, I was interested in how do you find these social issues within your con company? I know that you were talking earlier about um, what was going on, and I wanted to know exactly how do you stay human within your company as it grows. So, our company, we have about about 90 staff in our company, and. To be honest, uh, a lot of the issues that come up are just kind of from what's present in the media, what's going on, but it kind of going toward the, uh, the diversity training and the racial equity training we've been working through, we did find that a little bit of our filter was coming from our senior leaders. What is it that we believe? What are we passionate about? And that would drive down what we would write about or know. And quite often, that would leave some of our employees a little bit isolated. Like, you know, I, that's not how I think about this. Years ago, we had a, a, around HB2, we had a great conversation about, um, a, about marriage equality. And my view, and my view from the legal perspective, was that marriage equality and gay, and gay marriage is a civil rights issue. I had not taken our African American employees' perspective on that into consideration, and they let me know it. And, it got a completely different perspective that in the South, this is not a civil rights issue to them. Now, I still think legally it is a civil rights issue, but they were offended by me comparing that to the civil rights issues that they had dealt with in real time growing up. So some of it is kind of learned the hard way by stepping into it. Uh, so we've become much more deliberate about listening, about having 
company events where we pose that question and ask for people to discuss. Uh, we're very deliberate about getting quiet voices out in that, so we'll always have a conversation where anyone can raise their hand, but then we'll also say, and here's paper to write something down you know, if you're not comfortable about, the, about saying it out loud. So we do the best that we can, I would say, to solicit that. Uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, quick question. Uh, you mentioned earlier that Kerman Foster brought you to get more insight into specialty and focusing. Are your margins at Redwood particularly different from the industry standard to where they would be focused on that? And you emphasized the role of technology into this. So I was trying to figure out how those two things apply. Okay. Um, so the first part, our margins are not markedly different. Uh, in, and most people think of insurance companies as just having like money coming out of their ears. They actually operate on a very tight margin. So what we're expected to return is 5% is underwriting profit, which means for every dollar of premium we pay, we get in, we pay out and, ex and expenses 95% of that and return 5% in underwriting profit. Now in good years, uh, an insurance company that invests that money over time, called the float, they can make money even when you're over 100%. But our margin's only about 5% that we work in. Our margin when we were purchased was probably over the last 10 years, two to 3% overall. Some years were high, some years were lower. Uh, and the price that was paid for us, I don't think if you had looked at it purely on paper, was it was a, uh, a factor a little probably higher than should have been paid. So they paid for a decent amount of our business, but then I think there's a premium on that for the kind of insight that we bring and what we can do differently and they learn to making them more of a specialist co company. In terms of technology, it's kind of a, how it plays into it. One of the biggest things that we're seeing right now is the data analytics completely transforming the, comp the, the entire industry. Right? So we're able to find insights in our claims that we never have before. You know what I mentioned in aquatics? It was a completely manual task, right? We had people out there nonstop going to these things. It's easy when you only have 20 to 30 of those a year that you go out and look at. Now let's say we want to fix slips, trips, and falls, which honestly accounts for about 50% of all of our general liability claims, there are, and that's thousands of them with very small payouts. What we're looking at now is how can we use different technological solutions to not only look at our insurance coding, but can actually do character and recognition and find patterns in the notes that our claims adjusters have written for the last 10 years to be able to find those. So let, maybe we want to find out what size tile is the best to use. We can now go back in notes and find that sort of thing. So those are the types of things that we are able to experiment on that are hopefully moving Crum and Forrester a little bit more. Yeah. So we, we've, we've dealt with that for several years in a couple ways. One is the technology taking over some people's jobs. Another is there has been a trend toward outsourcing. So we actually work with a company called Resource Pro, which is based out of China and India, that does a lot of our processing now. Um, and now we vetted them to make sure that they, are, that they pay a living wage, that they give their employees time off, that they are, have a positive impact on their community. Uh, so we did all the vetting, right, and we think that, that that's fair, but we had staff who were doing those jobs. What we told them is, I know you're nervous, uh, but your jobs are safe. And we say that at almost every meeting right now. Your jobs are safe if you are willing to adapt, you're willing to take on new responsibilities, you're willing to try something new. So if you're a part of our team, we, we have never laid someone off at Redwoods, and we certainly hope we never will but we'll let people go if they're not willing to change and adapt and meet the responsibilities of their job. And for the most part, people do. Right? If you offer the right training, you move them into the right spot, they're willing to do it. And if they're not, it just doesn't wind up being the right fit and they find another place to go. Our, so our longer term customers know, and we don't position ourselves as the low cost provider. 
However, in new markets, so boys and girls clubs, for example, is one of the newer markets that we're in, we often only win new business at the low price. What, we, what we're realizing, though, is how you find a market opportunity to say, honestly, boys and girls clubs have been underserved, and the, the companies that have been in that market have been charging them too much. So we're able to come in at a lower price with better service and win that business. And now what we'll say is, if you do the things that we work together on, we're going to try to keep a sustainable price over time. Most insurance prices in the commercial space kind of go up and down based on the markets. We try to keep as consistent as possible. So it's the, the profits go to different places in a, in a B corporations, and it depends on the corporate structure. Right? So our profits do roll up to Fairfax, uh, who invests them globally, has a number of different kinds. So Fairfax, for example, just bought all the Toys R Us's in Canada. They do a whole bunch of strange and different things. Now, they also are, are, I think, they're not a B corporation. They exist to make a profit. They do some good social responsibility and, um, and oh, charity work. Right, so they're a $50 billion company. They give away $50 million every year, a little bit less than that, I think. So they have a good impact in what they do. Uh, depending on the company, before we were acquired, we were a uh, solely employee-owned company, most by our founders, uh, but then the profits would go to the workers. Right, so it depends on the corporate structure. Yeah. Any questions? All right, well, if there are no more questions, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. There's no, uh, no more. If, if you are legally not the, uh, a, a B company, but the, the for benefit. Yeah, we're certified. Yeah. Does that uh, protect the culture and practices of a company when they are acquired by a for profit or a public entity? So just being certified does not unless you work really hard at it. Uh, yeah, but I mean the other the legal, one, the legal one does protect it. Um, so the legal one, that'll be the corporate structure. However, it, you could still have that taken apart in an acquisition depending on the structure of the acquisition. So my last job as general counsel for Redwoods was being acquired by Crum and Forster. Um, and we were uh, an S Corp at that point uh, because we couldn't be a legal B Corp when that happened. The, uh, we had to put a lot of work into actually having written into the founding documents of the new corporation that we became as we merged into Crum and Forster that we would always exist as a certified B corporation or equivalent as long as that is allowed. Um, so that, it, it took a little more manual work, uh, but in terms of the legal status, the legal status is designed to protect that, but it has not been tested to a point that I think it's fully, I think you could undo it unfortunately. I think it's better protection than having nothing, though, because an acquiring company should know what they're buying. Sure. Well, thank you. Let's give one last round of applause for our oh, Thank you. Guys.